Even in peacetime, the early submarine service worldwide was a risky business. Sailors learned on the job, and science and technology was constantly pushing the known boundaries further out with each dive and each new boat. There was little room for error, and the greatest foe to any submariner was not another vessel, but the ocean herself, which took advantage of any mistake or weakness in boat or crew. The submarine service soon acquired a new nickname among some sailors, the Coffin Service. At first, there were no provisions or plans to rescue a sub's crew if the boat went down. There was no such protocol in place for surface ships, either. But with their multiple watertight compartments, subs had the unique capability to entomb their crews in dry, watertight rooms until the air ran out. Early crews quickly proved the lengths they would go to save themselves. September 1st, 1920. In 20 years of the United States Submarine Force, only two subs had sunk, and on the morning of September 1st, a third nearly joined them. A jammed air induction valve forced the USS S-5 to the ocean floor in 194 feet of water. All 40 hands were stranded, with four compartments partially flooded. After numerous attempts to empty the boat of water and to bring her to the surface, the crew used the last of their compressed air to empty the stern ballast tanks. The S-5 shot to the surface, but only her stern. Her nose remained stuck in the mud, and now seawater began to flood into her batteries, forming deadly chlorine gas. Her crew climbed their vertical boat, locking the bulkheads on the way up. 55 miles from shore, no one was looking for them, and they were going to have to cut their way through a three-quarter inch thick steel hull using just a manual drill before the oxygen ran out or the chlorine seeped in. 24 hours later, their hull was only six by eight inches, and many of the men were unconscious from the lack of oxygen or were too weak to continue drilling. Ships had passed by in the distance, but the S-5 was too low in the water to be easily seen. Another one now passed, and desperate for help, the crew wrenched loose a copper pipe, tied a t-shirt to it, and thrust it through the small hole, waving desperately. It worked. The small freighter, SS Alanthus, already well past the S-5, saw this strange sight and turned to investigate. Alanthus drew alongside the S-5 and lashed herself to their stern, stabilizing the S-5 and pumped in fresh air and water. With no radio and no drill herself, she was unable to help the crew continue cutting. But Alanthus soon flagged down the much larger General Gothels. Gothels had the means to help drill, and shortly after midnight on September 3rd, all 40 men of the S-5 squirmed out of their submarine and into fresh air. December 7th, 1921. The new submarine, S-48, not yet commissioned into the Navy, was running her builder's trials off Penfield Reef with a civilian crew of 46 and five naval observers. During one dive, a manhole cover was not secured, and the stern of the S-48 suddenly flooded, dropping 60 feet to the ocean's floor, leaving her bow high and dry. Quickly realizing there was no way to blow the stern to the surface, the crew moved most of the items to the stern to lighten the bow and keep it above the waves. They then broke the interlock on torpedo tube number two, allowing both the interior and exterior doors to open at the same time and crawled out onto the bow. But there was a new problem. It was now night, and what matches the crew had on them were not enough to attract the attention of passing freighters for assistance. Soon, they came up with a new plan. Wriggling back into the S-48, they shoved their mattresses through the same torpedo tube out onto the tip of the bow where the crew set them on fire. This blaze attracted the attention of the passing tug number 28, who rescued all 51 men. The S-48 was eventually salvaged and went on to have a long career in which she would be activated three times, round at least once, sink a second time, but never lose a crewman. October 28, 1924. 
the USS 05 was making her way to the Panama Canal. A series of miscommunications and navigation errors caused the 05 to collide with the fruit steamer Abanganes. Three men were killed instantly, and 17 scrambled for the surface. Suddenly one man, Henry Briault, remembered his friend Chief Lawrence Brown had been asleep in his cabin. Briault leapt back into the sinking O5, dogging the hatch shut just as the water closed over it. O5 settled in 42 feet of water as Briault discovered Brown, awake, but unaware of the abandoned ship order, sitting in his cabin. Seawater soon poured into Brown's compartment and both men fled to the forward torpedo room, dogging that bulkhead shut just as the seawater spilled into the battery and it exploded. Soon, both men heard tapping along the hull. Salvage divers had already arrived and were looking for survivors. Brown later wrote his memories of what happened the next few hours. Brailt and I separated to pound on each of the boat's sides. In this way, the rescuers could know that there were two of us. We heard scraping on the hull for hours. A couple of times we felt the O5 being lifted, then we got tossed roughly back when the slings broke. We knew they were hard after us. This buoyed our hope for rescue tremendously. Finally, the sub began to be tilted upwards slowly. We heard our comrades walking on the deck. Brailt opened the hatch and we could see daylight. We were saved. O5 had been lifted through the tireless efforts of a team of divers and the world's largest crane barge, Ajax. The rescue had taken nearly 31 hours. Despite these and other incredible escapes in submarine forces around the world, luck was not always on the submariner's side. Two submarine disasters in particular would spur one man to design the means for submariners to save themselves. <laughs>